on Sunday morning, July 12th, 2020, at 8.50 a.m. in San Diego and around the world, we woke up to images of an American ship on fire in a port. Not since December 7th, 1941, has such an image really captured the imagination of the nation and the world. USS Bonhomme Richard, LHD-6, had a fire ignite in its lower vehicle deck. And that fire, over the course of the day, consumed the vessel. And here we are four days later, and we're seeing the potential loss of a billion-dollar asset in the United States Navy. Fortunately, no one died. Very few people were hurt. But the fire efforts continue as I speak, and the fate of the Bonhomme Richard is in doubt. I followed this event live as it happened on news, social media, and began to tweet it out via my account. Uh, over the course of the day, gained about 500 Twitter followers. Thank you. Uh, and I had a lot of people in the San Diego area and people I've known send me information, images, and really caught my attention to this story. And what I want to do is unravel what we know about that first day for all of you. Uh, it'll be months until we get the official reports and get any sort of concept about what happened. But right now, with the events still unfolding, I think it's important to look at that first day, the images we have, and not make guesses by any means. But let's look at what we saw, take some deductions, and really try to figure out what we visualize that day. Many people have an interest in the Navy. Many people are outside the Navy but don't understand what was going on that day. And so what I want to do is take that morning and that course of the day into the evening and really examine it and figure out what we know and what questions we should be asking going forward. Now, you may be asking, well, why you? What, what's your background? Well, I'm Sal Mercagliano. I'm an associate professor of history at Campbell University in North Carolina. Now, why does a history professor have any knowledge about any of this? In a former life, uh, I went to the State University of New York Maritime College uh, and was a merchant mariner, sailed for the United States Navy for three years in the military seal of command. One out of every five ships in the U.S. Navy have civilian mariners on board. That's what I did, underwear replenishment. Worked ashore for military seal of command for four years in their pre-positioning program with the Marine Corps and the Army, so large multi-deck vehicle ships, very much like the Bonhomme Richard, uh, I dealt with. Uh, I left government service and embarked on an academic career. I got a master's in maritime history and nautical archaeology from East Carolina University and a PhD in military and naval history from the University of Alabama. Uh, to work my way through graduate school, I became a firefighter. Uh, I liked firefighting on ships. It was, a, it was a skill that I really enjoyed. And so I applied it uh, to eat <laughs> through grad school. But also, I've been a firefighter now for 20 years. I'm a captain. On my local fire department, I actually worked for a city fire department for a few years. So I know ships, I know fire, uh, and this is a topic that's of interest to me. So with that, let's look at what happened that July morning and try to see how we can piece this together. So these images here come from Channel 8 News in San Diego. They have an entire, about an eight-hour block here a video that they use to capture the event. The first imagery you have here is from the pier, uh, or looking at the pier, in Navy Base San Diego out in a parking lot. And what you see here is that large beginning of black smoke start to emerge uh, from the ship. Uh, very pronounced, very large, uh, definitely a, a, a building fire as we see develop here. Uh, to the left of that smoke, you'll see the pair of destroyers that were sharing Pier 2 with the Bonhomme Richard. Uh, closest to us will be the Fitzgerald, and then further down the pier is the USS Russell. And you see the fire is substantial at this point. Uh, we're already getting some black smoke out of it, and the color of smoke is going to be very important to understand. Uh, black heavy smoke tends to be a, a, a heavy fuel oil or something. We'll see that later on. But this fire right now, what we're seeing, this type of smoke you're seeing coming out right now, is basically what you expect to see in what's called a Class A fire. That is a fire of consumable materials, hard materials, wood, cardboard, that type of material, kind of heavy fuel fire. And that's exactly what we see emerging at this time. 
So in this direction, we're basically looking west, heading out, looking out toward the Pacific Ocean. And you can see that the smoke is, is coming towards us and, and, and moving uh, right to left, which uh, basically gives us the direction of the wind. We're getting a, an offshore wind at this time, so the wind is kind of blowing out of the, the north northwest, heading toward the southeast. Uh, hard to see, but if you see some red images down there and some flashing lights, those are the fire trucks that are arriving. So when this fire got initiated, it triggered a call for a response from shoreside fire. So the federal fire department, which is the fire department for all government bases, would have been triggered and called out at this time. And based on the severity of this fire, this fire stepped up to a three alarm fire requiring a response from not just federal fire department, but neighboring fire departments, national city and the San Diego fire department. This eventually became a three alarm fire. In other words, there were three separate dispatches or three levels of fire alarms were sent out triggering the response that we're going to see here to help extinguish this fire or to battle this fire, I should say. One of the things you begin to see here is really the intensity of this fire growing. The scope and scale of the smoke is, is, is increasing. And understand, smoke is incomplete combustion. So what you're seeing here is part of the material that is being consumed by the fire being thrown up into the air. And this smoke is venting out of the structure, which in this case is the Bonham Richard. Uh, it's going to make it very difficult to operate inside the vessel. And we're going to talk a little bit more here about the vessel in a second. But this smoke is, is an indicator for the scope and scale and intensity of the fire. You can see the destroyers are completely blocked out at this time. Uh, and actually the other vessels that were further south of Pier 2 now can't be seen. So this is a growing fire and of major concern at this point. This view is the helicopter for Channel 8 News coming in over Navy Base San Diego that morning, taking a look at the Bonham Richard and the fire that's broken out on the vessel. And before we go any further, it's really important to understand what type of vessel Bonham Richard is. And I'm not just talking about the fact that she's an amphibious vessel or in the U.S. Navy. Uh, she's a substantially large vessel, 844 feet long. So be thinking about that in terms of length. We'll be talking about hose lengths off fire trucks and how difficult it is to stretch hose through a vessel of that size. 105 foot wide. She's a very wide vessel uh, restricted by the Panama Canal. 27 foot dra uh, draft on the vessel, 40,000 tons. But more importantly, this vessel is a combination of four different type vessels. She's an LHD, a landing helicopter dock. She's the sixth of the eight uh, WASP class LHDs. She was just coming out of a shipyard, which is going to be significant in our discussion, uh, and being upgraded to handle the new F 35B Lightning uh, vertical attack plane. But more importantly, is the internal makeup of this ship. So this is a schematic drawing of the internal configuration of a LHD like the Bonham Richard. And as I mentioned before, she's a combination of four ships. The forward third of the ship, the, the very right side of that imagery right there in the bow section is accommodations. That's where crew members and the embarked Marines live. Now, Bonham Richard typically has a crew complement of about 1,100 on board. And as we'll talk about, they were not all on board this vessel key thing uh, with dealing with the fire. So first off, she's a, a troop ship. She carries Marines on board. Then you have the imagery in the middle, and she's also a vehicle carrier. She carries the equipment, uh, rolling vehicles, LAVs, trucks, Humvees, you name it, on two decks, an upper vehicle deck, which is above the machine space, and then a lower vehicle deck. And that lower vehicle deck, number 18 on that diagram, is going to be important because that's where the fire is reported at 8.50 that morning. And she has ramps that allow vehicles to drive up and down them, down to the well deck, which we'll talk about, and up onto the hangar deck, and eventually up onto the flight deck also, uh, if needed via elevators. So she is a combination troop ship, but now she's also a roll-on, roll-off vessel, which means she has these large open areas to move vehicles around. Also means she has ventilation for vehicle exhaust to come out. The after part of the vessel is the well deck area. This ship is an LHD. It's an amphibious vessel, meaning that the ship can flood down ballast tanks on the after part of the vessel. And with a stern ramp down, you can actually flood the stern area and take landing craft on board, either traditional landing craft or what they call LCAX landing craft air cushion. Uh, 
and she can basically amphibiously land her marine contingent ashore. So the after part of the vessel is an amphibious vessel. The middle part is a vehicle storage area, and below that vehicle storage area is the main engineering compartments of the vessel. She's a she's a, a traditional steam plant vessel. She's not a gas turbine like the Macon Island is, the very last vessel uh, in the class. And then forward, she's a troop ship. And then the last thing she is is a flight deck. She's a helicopter, and more importantly, being reconfigured for those F-35. So she has a hangar deck roughly from the the after two-thirds of the vessel, and then a full flight deck up on board, and then with a superstructure on top to the starboard side, the right side of the vessel. Uh, The ship is built out of steel, steel hull, but that superstructure is aluminum. And then with a series of elevators aft, one uh, aft on the starboard side and one about midships on the port side, she's able to move aircraft up and down to that flight deck. Bonhomme Richard had just come out of a two-year-long availability at the National Steel and Shipbuilding Company, NASCO, there in San Diego. Matter of fact, you'll see images of NASCO just below in this image. So she had not been fully turned back over to the Navy. She was doing an upgrade to handle those F-35s. It was a quarter of a billion dollar upgrade, two years, supposed to be done back in May, and had not yet been completed, which means that Bonhomme Richard had not got fully back into service, and that's going to be a big issue right now in this investigation of this fire. So, for example, the crew had just moved back on board the previous week, and so ship the crew ship's crew had not been living on their vessel. And it's very conceivable that some of the duty section, this ship was probably split into a six uh, six duty sections and one duty, this one duty section pulled duty on Sunday morning. Uh, the crew had been living off the vessel, either on shore facilities, or if you look at this kind of square little box off the stern to the left there up against the pier, that's a, that's a birthing barge. So one of the, some of the crew were probably living on them. So the crew had just been moving on board, but the ship was still in the availability period. When you look closer at the vessel, you'll notice there are Connex container boxes on the vessel. There's cranes. So in the interior of the ship, this ship is being broken up and there's work being done throughout the vessel. And so normally if this ship was, and I've had a lot of people say this, and I've heard this, that if Bonhomme Richard had its full 1,100 person complement on board, had the ship been at sea and fire breaks out in the lower vehicle deck, then they would have the advantage of having full crew on board. They can man their damage control stations immediately, and very quickly they can put uh, water on this fire and get it out. The condition that Bonhomme Richard finds itself in is unique. Ship is just coming out of a shipyard period. Uh, There's a question about who's in charge of this fire, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. But right now, she's still being fitted out, and that means that without all the crew on board, a lot of the safety features that would normally be used on a vessel, a lot of the safety procedures that would normally be used are not in play on this vessel. And that's one of the reasons why we see this. So normally when you when you have a ship and you have a fire go off, you go through a series of steps. You sound off the fire alarm, fire, 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 and then you begin a series of steps. One of the big one on board a ship is isolating the vessel, is basically shutting steel hatches, dropping fire, t- uh, f- uh, fire doors, uh, securing ventilation, charging the fire main system, and doing everything you need to do to prevent the spread of this fire. I mean, a ship is basically a steel box, honeycombed into smaller little boxes. And what you're trying to do is keep that fire isolated in as few of those boxes as you can. Imagine Lego in, a, in this situation. You have a fire inside one Lego piece. You want to keep it inside that Lego piece. If the fire breaches out of that piece, it's going to spread to other ones. And traditionally, if you have fire in a compartment, for example, on a vessel, one of the easiest ways to extinguish a fire in a vessel is to secure that compartment. Shut the hatches, fire the watertight or, and fire uh, doors Secure ventilation and let oxygen smother it. You need three things for a fire. You need fuel, you need oxygen, and then you need a heat source. That creates your fire triangle or fire tetrahedron, as some people like to say. With You need the combination of all three to get fire. And if you secure that space, cut it off from oxygen, it will eventually starve out a fire. And 
If you give it time to cool, you remove the heat element from it. You've removed oxygen, you've removed heat, and then therefore you can do it. Now, one of the things you have to do in that scenario on board a ship is make sure a fire doesn't spread. It doesn't radiate through the steel bulkheads. So you'd put fire watches in place or on the four sides of that compartment and above and below it. That's one of the easiest ways to do it. Now, this fire supposedly started down in the lower V deck or the deep V, the, 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 that bottom vehicle deck. And that vehicle deck is an interesting thing. It's a big, wide, open area and because you have vehicles in there. It has a ventilation system because if you run the vehicles in there, you can't have carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide build up in there. So you typically have a ventilation area in there. And in the case of a fire down there, what you would do is send your fire parties in to use foam, AFFF, for example, aqueous film fighting foam, uh, film forming foam, excuse me, to cover uh, vehicles in case it's an oil fire, a class B fire. Or if it's a vehicle fire, it's a class A, the vehicle itself is on fire. You can use water on it or you can use uh, extinguishers if it's an electrical fire, a class C fire. You can do a variety of different things to do this. This fire because it takes place in this large open area, can expand very quickly. And there's a big question about what happened at 820. We don't know. I, I mean, 850. Nobody knows right now. That's going to be the investigation that's going to find out what happens. Were the 160 personnel estimated to be on board able to, for example, secure all the hatches, secure ventilation, uh, secure the fire doors? Probably not. There's probably cables and hoses running throughout this vessel. So the watertight integrity and the fire integrity of the vessel is probably compromised. Uh, Were the engine spaces manned and ready? Were they on shore power or on ship's power? If they're not on ship's power, are they able to fire up the fire mains? Are the fire mains compromised? One of the things that uh, becomes readily apparent, and I watch this video quite a bit, is how much this looks like ship fires from early in World War II, especially carrier fires. Uh, ships like the Lexington and the Wasp suffer these these tremendous fires uh, during World War II. And one of the things that happens in World War II is we learn how to do damage control. The U.S. Navy gets with the New York City Fire Department, and they de- develop means of how to basically fight fire. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But the question is, what happens? With a very limited crew number on board the vessel, they're going to need help. Uh you have choices here. Do you, do you outfit your firefighting teams? Do you go in and try to put this out? Do you secure ventilation to prevent the fire spread? So that'll be a big question. But one of the things they'll do is call for shoreside fire support. And as I mentioned to you before, this is a three alarm fire, and we see firefighters responding to this call. Now, as I mentioned to you earlier, I'm a trained firefighter. I learned how to do shipboard firefighting. I was trained in shipboard firefighting. And then after leaving sailing, came ashore and became a, a firefighter, first paid and now volunteer. And I have to say that there's two different philosophies in firefighting, shipboard versus land side. On shipboard side, you are ingrained with the concept that what isn't on fire is your house. And you are the last thing preventing jumping in the water and having to swim away from your vessel. So fighting fires on on ships are are always this concept that you have to extinguish them and you have to be very proactive and on them fast or else you have the scenario where a fire could run the of your ship. On land, it's a little bit different. Uh, There are different concepts at play. Uh, Shoreside firefighters have great experience. They're well-trained. They fight fires on a routine basis. I fought a fire yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, So they have the practical experience of putting the wet stuff on the red stuff, so to speak. Navy firefighters are extremely well-trained. They go through the motions. They go through the training, but they don't typically experience too many real actual fires. And so you have a very different level of experience. You also have how firefighters deal with fires on land you have the option to call for mutual aid. You have the option to back away from a fire and reassess and go into what's called a defensive stance, which was what we're going to see on this fire. There's a moment in this fire early on where there's an explosion reported on board. Not exactly clear what that explosion was. In the press conference at the end of this e- this day on July 12th, the admiral in command of ESG-3 mentioned that he thought it was a backdraft, that it was a pressurization. Uh, One of the things that happens in that scenario I gave you where if you seal a compartment, 
If you don't allow that compartment to cool down and you open up that hatch prior to it cooling down, you introduce oxygen to it, you have what's called technically a flashover. Uh, it's more dramatic to call it a backdraft because there's a Kurt Russell movie with it. But basically, you have a flashover. And that flashover can sound like an explosion. Uh, there could be oil drums. There could be other means that that would cause the explosion on board the vessel. Uh, it'll be interesting to note whether there was a communication between the shoreside firefighters and the vessel's crew about the status of this vessel. I'm not 100% sure that that was adequately communicated. This was a vessel coming out of a maintenance period. Because if you're coming out of a maintenance period, number one, you don't have aircraft on board. And you don't have munitions on board, except for maybe some small arms. Uh, so if you're worried about bombs, if you're worried about a, a aircraft carrier blowing up, or in this case, an LHD, you're going to fight that fire in a little different stance. And so one of the things that typically happen on shoreside fires is you would ask to see what's the hazardous material you have on board. Uh, you know, what's the hazardous material in your structure and your vehicles? There are placards on side of buildings that have those indicators. Uh, Navy ships don't have that. And that is a communication that had to be done between the federal fire department and the ship's crew. And what becomes readily apparent, and I happen to be able to listen to this fire on real time through a scanner uh, on my computer, I listened to it. And there was a series of reports of explosions, both on board the vessel and on the pier. And it was at that moment that they decided to sound the alarm. And uh, one of the things in a, another video that was put out by the Navy, you'll hear these horns blowing, a series of horn blasts on the, on the engines and, and, and apparatus that are on the scene. That indicates a, a, a evacuation. And then the crews called for a PAR, personal accountability report. In other words, I want to make sure that no one was missing. And so they undertook this PAR and they decided to shift into a defensive stance. They decided basically to pull everybody off the vessel, all the fire crews off the pier, and basically do what's what's in shoreside fire called surround and drown. Basically get water around the, the vessel and start spraying it off to cool it off. That works really well on large structure fires. On v vessel fires, it's a completely different beast. So after the initial reports of explosions on board the ship and on the pier, the fire departments initiated the PAR. They ordered a pullback and get into a defensive stance. They had apparatus on the pier. They would put towers and aerials. Those are ladder trucks. Uh, and you feed those with long hoses. Now, there's a question about, I'm not sure if there's water on this pier. In other words, are there hydrant hookups for it? Or do they have to lay in these long five inch large diameter hoses in to spray they had aerials up to start spraying water on it and this image right here is, is a really important one let's take a look at the fire for a second and where this is at so you can see the fire emanating from the middle of the ship so to the left there is the stern that's where the well deck area is to the right is the forward area and the forward area is not involved yet which makes sense the forward area is honeycombed into compartments and it's going to take a long time for the fire to get into that area where the fire is going to expand very quickly is from the center of the ship about right under the island those two masts you see sticking up is the island that's the superstructure and then on the side of the ship there you'll see these open areas these open ports and those go out to the hangar into the upper vehicle deck and the fire started right below that in that lower v that lower vehicle deck and what it's going to do is move up. It's going to progress up to the next level, which is the upper vehicle deck, through those open areas, which are probably full of equipment and gear because of the overhaul that's going on and the maintenance going on. 
It's going to go in. And understand, these ships are steel boxes, so the heat's going to start building up and it's going to get caught by the overhead. And one of the things we do in commercial firefighting and residential firefighting is we cut holes in the roofs to let the heat out. And what that does is it just dissipates the heat. It allows the smoke to clear out. You could put a fan in the front door or something like that and do what they call positive pressure and push the air out. That doesn't work in a steel box ship. It just doesn't. And what winds up happening is the steel box turns into an oven. And in the case of Bonham Richard, what you're getting here is, this, is the, uh, the heat is building up. It's going to hit the top of the overhead, and it's just going to start moving forward and aft. In this case, it's going to run aft because of the way the hangar deck is and the vehicle deck is. The other thing to look in this shot are the boats, the two fire boats that are right there. You see between two and three fire boats. These are from the San Diego Harbor Police. San Diego Harbor Police are dual tasked. They're a law enforcement agency and they're a fire protection agency. And they run five boats, five 36 foot boats that have two monitors on board. Each of those monitors can flow about a thousand gallons per minute. And you'll see them being used at this time. And while I was listening to the dispatch, one of the things that came across from the fire command ashore was a question or a query to these boats. Do you have foam on board? Now, as I stated earlier, the concept that they need foam would be applicable if this was a Class B fire, if it was a gas fire, an oil fire, if it was an aircraft fire. And so there's a question that's raised here. Do they realize what is on board the ship? Uh, the response that came back from the fireboats, again, these are 36 foot long boats with two monitors on board, each capable of spraying about 1,000 gallons per minute, was yes, they have about 100 gallons of foam on board. And what that is is foam concentrate. You mix that foam solution. And AFFF, aqueous film forming foam, usually is sprayed at anywhere between 1% to 6% solution. Uh, and, and what you're doing with foam is you're creating a blanket. The blanket is key. What the blanket does is it gets between the, the material it's burning and the air. So you're creating a barrier between the two. So you're breaking one of those three parts of the fire triangle. And the other thing you're doing, too, is cooling. And so you're actually doing two. It's very effective foam. Uh, the problem with foam is you have to lay a lot of it, and it has to be perfect. If there's a, a break in the blanket and you let air in, the fire just kicks back in. So these boats report, and again, I was listening to this at the time, that they had 100 gallons of foam on board. Now, 100 gallons of foam isn't 100 gallons of foam spray. It's 100 gallons of concentrate. What that means is they can spray at a 3% solution 3,000 gallons of water. 3,000 gallons of foam, excuse me, 3,000 gallons of foam. It mixes with the solution. So 3% foam, 97%. Water, uh, 3,000 gallons of water through a 1,000 gallon per minute applicator, or, or in this case, the master streams they're using, is enough foam for three minutes. That's all they have. If they're spraying both with foam, then it's a minute and a half. And that's not a lot of time to spray a foam solution down to cover a vessel. And one of the things that you'll see are these this kind of white area around these boats that white area is a lot of sometimes it's the weight kicking up from the boats but lots of time it's foam it's foam from uh, kicking off the side of the vessel and what they're trying to do is get the foam into those open apertures on the side of the vessel to try to get it into that interior the problem is these boats they're not the size that you would normally see for fire boats. They, they're, they, they're great if it's a small pleasure boat, if it's a, a, even if it's a, a excursion boat of some kind. But for a full-fledged, large vessel fire the size of the Bonham Richard, these boats are really small in doing this. You need something much larger. To give you an idea, Long Beach and Los Angeles each have dedicated fire boats. And each of their fireboats have the capability of pumping at least 40,000 gallons per minute through a series of monitors. Uh, that's a lot more than 2,200 gallons per minute, which the boats in San Diego have. Now, there are other boats that can be used. The question is, are they going to be called in? And one of the things that we'll see is uh, there's a series of what's called sea tractors. Those are the tugboats that are in San Diego, they are used uh, for moving vessels on and off the berth, run by Edison Shawest, a company out of Louisiana. Uh, they're going to be called in, but they're going to be used for something different initially, and they're going to be used to help move Russell and Fitzgerald off the dock.
So this is a really interesting moment of the fire right here. So if you look in the water between the littoral combat ships, those small vessels in the in the foreground there, and the Bonhomme Richard, you'll see the fireboats going in. Uh, you'll see the white on the water. That's that foam kicking off. Now, these boats can only spray for anywhere from, you know, a minute and a half to three minutes, depending on how much water they're spraying. And then they have to go off to the right, off the bow of the ship, to meet a supply boat and get resupplied with AFFF. So you're not keeping a lot of water on here for a long period of time. But if you look at this fire right now, you see it coming out from the midship section of the vessel. You see it, it's smoking pretty heavily right now. We're seeing kind of white smoke coming out of the forward area there, a little darker smoke coming out of the back. It's venting out through those ports on it. But if you look aft right now, you'll start seeing heavy black smoke coming out after under the uh, starboard side elevator. Heavy black smoke. Uh, this indicates a petroleum-based fire. Uh, there was a report on the scanner of Navy personnel reporting that the, the fire has gotten into the ship's fuel tank. This is probably the indicator right here that they're thinking. This is not a, a fuel fire. The ship's fuel tanks are on the very bottom of the ship, below everything, cooled by the bay water, very hard, and it's carrying a million gallons of, of diesel oil, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not in terms of how much fuel oil a vessel carries. But you see this heavy black smoke, and you'll see this zoom in right here. What this is probably, it's some sort of building construction material. It may be the skid paint for the deck. Uh, I've seen fires like this of pallets of, of, of uh, uh, tile, for example. Uh, it's a, it's a petroleum-based product that's burning there. But what that's telling you is that fire has run the entire length of the hangar deck. So that deck just below the top of the vessel, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the weather deck area, has rolled. And you see this thick, thick black smoke come out. You can see how different it is versus the rest of the fire. That's an indicator. It's an indicator that the fire is run from the forward part where the troop compartment is, the far length of the ship, all the way to the stern. And one of the interesting things you'll see is the, the fireboats will shift over to start spraying some foam in there, but it is it goes out very quickly. And I'm not exactly sure the fireboats extinguish it as much as whatever's burning is extinguished. But what you're having happen now in the hangar deck here is it's becoming an oven. It's just holding the heat in, and the heat is radiating down from above. This is happening on the hangar deck. It's happening on the vehicle decks. And that amount of heat is just spontaneously combusting material there. Once that material heats up to a certain level, it's going to start burning and all that heat is trunking up and it's got to find an escape route out it's coming out those side ports and so you know if you were trying to get onto this vessel through one of the gangways or through uh, the elevators that are down on the port side you're going to get hit by a wall of heat i mean just an amazing amount of heat and it's like an oven inside this vessel it's absolutely amazing and that heat is not just rising up out of the vessel it's going into that superstructure that superstructure which is aluminum is holding that heat and one of the reasons that you see the fire that we'll see later on burst out toward the evening is the, is the structure couldn't hold the heat anymore. It was probably breaking through uh, 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 compartments, heating the next compartment, and you see it venting out. And this is a big element right here. That black smoke coming out tells you that there's a pretty serious fire, and it's one of the reasons why they were concerned that maybe the, the, the tanks had gotten involved. Now, understand right below that, is the well deck area. The ship's well deck was down. You can get into the well deck, go up that vehicle deck, and get into the interior of the vessel and fight fire. The question is, how much obstruction is in that well deck area on that vehicle deck? How easy is it is to get in there and start fighting that fire? What you need at that point when you see that black smoke is as many fireboats as you can putting foam and other material on it. That's where your foam needs to go. And you'll see at this point that that heavy black smoke is starting to change color a little bit. It's starting to change. And that's because it's either burning out or uh, the material there is just uh, have been extinguished enough. And more than likely, it burned out. But you're going to see it keep billowing out from that area. That's a key tell in this fire. So I want to be clear. I want to give the highest accolades to the San Diego Harbor Police for, for the actions they took. This is phenomenal work for them to get in there. And for the length of time they fought that fire. The situation that they have is just they don't have the what I would call the proper equipment to fight a vessel fire of this size. But they're in there fighting that fire pretty well. You see them, at least two to three of those boats, 
at all time. The forward boat, the one on the right here, is cooling the hull. You'll see that a lot. They'll be in there trying to cool that hull. And remember, fire radiates through a variety of means, and one of them is by going through the length of the vessel, through the steel. So they're trying to keep that hull cool, and that's going to start preventing it. But one of the things you're starting to see is that white smoke there kicking forward. And if you watch the full video, you'll see the containers on deck slowly get covered one by one, moving forward as they go. These other boats are spraying, but the issue they keep coming back to is they don't want to spray into those open hatches unless they have foam on board. Problem is they don't have a lot of foam to, to spray. Again, only about three to, to, to three minutes to a minute and a half, depending on, on, on the percentage and, and if they're fl f flying it with both monitors. You'll see the aft boat back there spraying into that compartment there uh, onto the into the hatch, into that aft hatch right there, and that black smoke is pretty much dissipated. But now you have a fire the entire two-thirds the length of this vessel from the aft flight deck and hangar deck all the way down into the vehicle decks at this point, up into the office spaces, which are just below the flight decks, and starting to uh, break into the superstructure and, and wanting to get into the forward part of this vessel. So this, this is a fire that's out of control at this point, obviously. And a defensive stance at this is not going to put this fire out. It'll contain it, but it's not going to put it out. You have got to put crews into the interior, but now this vessel is like an oven. And even fire-resistant equipment, you see firefighters putting their gears on. That's only good for 500 degrees. Anything more, once you get in over 500 degrees, you're going to start melting your gear. And we make firefighting gear so good today that firefighters can get themselves into extremis before they realize their gear is failing. Um, basically, when your gear starts to melt, it's too late at that point. So you got to be extremely careful. That's why a lot of those casualties you saw after this event was heat exhaustion just happens. You, you dehydrate quickly you get heat prostration heat uh, uh, heat exhaustion and it, it it takes a big toll on firefighters and that is trained firefighters let alone young navy crews going in to perhaps fight their first actual fire and it's one of the worst fires they've ever seen so as a naval and maritime historian one of my favorite periods of study is the world wars world war 1 world war 2 and during the attack on Pearl Harbor, there is a, a moment when the ships realize that they're under attack and some of the vessels are able to get underway. It's, it's a heroic effort. Uh, one of the most famous is the battleship Nevada, the only battleship during the attack on Pearl Harbor to be able to get underway and set sail. It doesn't make it out of the harbor. It gets attacked by, during the second wave by Japanese dive bombers and forced to beach itself. Uh, under the command of Joseph Tosic, uh, the son of, of a similarly named officer, uh, that officer, Joseph Tosic Sr., commanded the first destroyers to go to Europe during World War I. His son then is in command of a vessel that's trying to break out. There are other ships that do it. Uh, the Neosho, a, a, a fleet oiler in the middle of uh, Battleship Row, backs his way out of the way to get out of there. Uh, there's a story of a destroyer, the Blue where a crew of ensigns get the ship underway and set sail during the attack. It, it's dramatized in a movie uh, in harm's way. But during the, attack, uh, during the fire here on the Bonham Richard, the two American destroyers, the Russell and the Fitzgerald, are across the berth from them, and they decide to back out. And unfortunately, the helicopters had flown off at this time, so we don't have an imagery of this. But this is an image from across the way. And the ship you see coming out here is the Russell. The Russell is, 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 is at this time, backing out here on the way. And we're seeing the, the destroyers actually do this breakout. It, it, it's harrowing. They're, they're clad in smoke. Ship you're going to see here moving from left to right is the Russell. She uh, had to come out stern stern first off the dock, out through the boom, the, the barrier that, that uh, surrounds the Navy base to prevent any spillage or any oil from getting out. And, and you'll see her coming across here. Uh, just a, again, just, just an, an epic performance by the vessel, uh, just, just seeing them to come out here and be able to get out. Again, I, I, I wish the helicopters had been in sight to see that because uh, it, it had to be an epic one to see from a height and a distance. So at this point, the Russell had pulled out, gone down the channel to the left, and then crossed in front. Uh, now coming out of the right, that gray 
mass you see coming out of the right, that's Fitzgerald coming out of the smoke. And again, Fitzgerald had been involved in a, in a deadly collision in 2017 with the MV ACX Crystal off the coast of uh, Japan. Seven of her crew members had died. Uh, her collision uh, was, was severe. She was able to get back into Japan, uh, loaded up on a heavy lift ship and, and brought to Pascagoula to be repaired. She had just come back into San Diego and now all of a sudden you have this massive fire on Bonham Richard. Again, the heat radiating off could damage electronics, uh, smoke into the vessel, uh, cause a lot of problems. And so Fitzgerald had to get off the berth here, and you see her coming out at this point. Uh, just a, a, a big event here. And again, I wish the imagery had been a little better to seeing this, because I think that's a, it's a powerful one for these ships to come out and to be able to get underway. Again, uh, the story behind them is going to be great. Uh, were the captains on board? Were these junior officers taking the ships out? Who were getting them out? How are they able to do that? Again, uh, one of the things that we're going to see time and time in these stories is moments of heroism, moments of courage uh, that we just don't know yet. But we're going to hear about them because when everyone was on top of Fitzgerald and McCain for their collisions, one of the things that we saw was absolute damage control by those two vessels. They saved their vessels. They saved crew members. I think the fact that Fitzgerald is, is sailing out right here in front of Bonham Richard is a, is, is a powerful, powerful symbol that, you, you, you know, even in, in this moment of, of darkness for the U.S. Navy, that here you have this image of a destroyer that was in the same situation, similar situation in 2017, and now she's back and fully operational. Don't know if we'll see Bonham Richard fully operational, but definitely one of the, those elements of, of, of spirit. Uh, the motto of the Bonham Richard from John Paul Jones is, I have not yet begun to fight. And uh, that's definitely one that Fitzgerald uh, can take that mantle. So one of my questions right off the bat is why San Diego does not have a large fireboat. Fireboats are important not just for spraying water, which is what the symbol seems to be, but the other thing a fireboat can do is hook in to a ship and, and energize its fire main. If the ship's power is down, they can't get the generators up, they can hook into the fire mains. And that allows you to fight fire off the vessel. If you're not fighting fire off the vessel system, you have to drag hose onto the vessel. And we know that's what's happening. We've seen enough images from the past few days to know that that's exactly what's happening. And matter of fact, one of the things that we've seen is they're using a tug to actually pump water to the ship. So the, the vessels you see here, the orange and, and yellow vessels there, those are three of the four Edison Shoest sea tractors. Uh, they were used to back Russell and Fitzgerald off the berth. Now you see them moving in. These are substantially larger vessels than the San Diego Harbor Police. They have fire monitors on board, too, much larger fire monitors. They could pump over 3,000 gallons of water at the time. And one of the things you see them doing is going into action. Now, they don't have foam systems, but one of the things you do see them doing is cooling operations. They're cooling down the hull, cooling down the superstructure. And uh, there's a great image that was lift, uh, put out by the Navy of the four vessels along the side there spraying. You don't see one of them there because that other vessel, Sea Tractor 9, is on the far side. Sea Tractor 9 was called in to provide water to pump to fire engines and apparatuses on the pier. And uh, a great operation was done by the crews on board these Sea Tractors. Uh, sea Tractor 9 in particular was used to uh, feed those engines. They had to modify their fire main, put on a manifold. Uh, so it can meet up with the fire systems of Fed Fire and San Diego Fire and provide it. And I guess one of the big questions I would ask is why they were not called upon sooner. Now, they may have been busy, may have been engaged. We don't know yet. These are questions that have to be asked. But as you see here, they're providing a pretty substantial fire suppression at the time. Uh, question is, is this a bit too late at the time to do it? What difference would they have made instead of pulling, for example, Russell and Fitzgerald off the, the dock, had they responded immediately, started getting water through the open bays on the side of the ship into the hangar deck and the upper vehicle deck, could that have been the difference at the time? And these are questions, again, I hate to second guess. I don't always, you know, I, I, I don't like it being done to me. But these are just questions that we're going to have to be asked as the investigation goes forward. This image you're seeing here is coming later in the evening. Uh, sun's starting to head down at this point. You'll see two of the sea tractors in action there on the forward part of the ship. The fire has moved forward. We we're seeing fire in the forward area of the vessel. Uh, they've got their aft monitors spraying on the, on the Bonham Richard. Their forward monitors are spraying 
out into the area between the reason they're doing that is they need to keep the fire pressure up on their main. So they, they don't want to shut down one of the monitors because it throws the pressures off. It's better to just keep flowing water through the monitors once you're at max pressure. But one of the things that's important to know is they're all the way forward at this point. And I think this is largely because later in the day, crews were able to get on board Bonham Richard and start fighting fires. They were able to get into the interior, at least onto the hangar deck and up through the well deck to start fighting fires. And so you don't want these massive, you know, 2,000, 3,000 gallon per minute cannons firing in and, and hitting you. It's, it's getting hit by a wall of water. So they'll move forward at this point so as not to do that. So there's got to be a lot of coordination at this point. Using fireboats and coordinating the interior attack is very important. You know, in, on structures on land, you never you do an exterior attack when the crews are inside. And so here you definitely see that be, taking place. There's good coordination between these teams. I guess one of the most significant things I've noticed in watching this fire the whole day, and this is right at the evening, you'll see the fireboats have pulled off. Crews may have pulled back, and you're seeing this heavy black smoke now billowing out of the superstructure. Fire has gotten up in the superstructure. The bridge has ignited. The forward area is ignited. A real dark black smoke. That means you have all that fuel fire. One of the things you can't see in these videos right now, but is 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 pretty present, is is the impact of 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 a uh, class D fire. Some blue flames will be coming up out of the ship at different times that we saw. We definitely saw some uh, images there. That's the inner stack layer probably burning and that aluminum itself probably of the superstructure started to burn. And there were moments throughout this fire that always seemed to be uh, getting it under control, getting it in hand. And there's always those big decision points when you're fighting a fire. At, at what point, you know, if you make this decision things go the different way. And obviously there's going to be a lot of moments where we're going to look back on that fire and try to figure out exactly what happened. You know, what was the deciding information based on what you know? And again, we, we got to remember, no one got killed in this fire. Uh, minimal number of casualties. People got hurt. Uh, you're going to get hurt fighting a fire. There's no doubt about it. But then you did lose a significant naval asset. Uh, may not be out of commission forever, but it's definitely not available in the foreseeable future. And that first day was it was a very revealing day. It's going to be an interesting analysis to see what happened. I, I think, again, you have to give the due credence to the crews that fought that fire. Uh, that's an epic fire. Uh, mo most importantly, we should be remembering the firefighters from Fed Fire, from San Diego, from National, from all the ships that responded to that, multiple crews came uh, to, to support their shipmates. Uh, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge to fight that fire. That ship fought a fire in not prime condition. But again, ships face that due to damage, due to combat. And one of the things that needs to be learned is what's the lesson learned from this? In 1967, the USS Forrestal suffered a, a catastrophic fire. And that video from that imagery of the Forestal fire has been required learning for many firefighters going forward. Uh, I'm not going to be surprised to see the Bonham Richard reach that level. And I hope by just taking a look at this and providing a little bit of background and analysis, it provides you a, a little more context to what was happening that day. This is the first swag in history. And one of the things I've learned as a historian for a long time is that history is never complete. It's never firmly written. You write history on a paper, you don't chisel it in granite. Uh, because history is, is not what we think it is. It changes over time. Uh, and more importantly, facts come out. Information comes out. And what we thought was going on wasn't exactly what was going on. So I hope uh, this provides you some background. And just remember, it is worth the electrons that are coming across your internet. It is, it is overcome by events uh, very quickly. But this is just a quick little snapshot based on my observations over the past few days. Thank you.